Hello, welcome to the DCL Learning Series. Today's webinar is titled, Heroes of Content Strategy, the Importance of a Cross-Functional Team. My name is Marianne Kalahana. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, I want to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, so please write your questions in the dialogue box as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer everything, we will get in touch with you personally after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and we'll be sure to send a link to everyone after the broadcast. I am happy to introduce two respected experts from the information management industry. We have Christopher Hill, Product Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and Alan J. Porter, Lead Content Strategist at A. Let's start with a quick introduction to their organizations. Chris, how about you tell us a little bit about DCL, Data Conversion Laboratory? Sure, thanks, Marianne. Uh, data Conversion Laboratory provides uh, data and content transformation services, and we uh, do this by applying a lot of different technologies. I won't go over everything on this slide, but it gives you an idea of the breadth of, of what we do. Um, we, we will take uh, all sorts of technologies, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, and really help businesses organize and structure their content uh, for modern technologies and platforms. So we're really trying to connect content uh, with the tools and, and help organizations get their content uh, to between their tools and to their customers in the formats uh, uh, that they need. Um, we've really been doing this since 1981. We got our start uh, very early on in the digital age. Uh, by focusing on digitization and scanning. And then we've uh, evolved since then to really be a full service uh, workflow and content uh, transformation uh, organization. And that's really just a quick overview of DCL. Um, I'll now turn it over to uh, Alan to describe a little bit about his organization. Thank you very much. So uh, at A, we like to uh, refer to ourselves as the uh, content intelligence company or the intelligent content company. Um, we like to make uh, believe that uh, you know our process uh, and goals is to make uh, smart companies uh, even smarter through the application of intelligent content. And we uh, do not have a particular product, software product or tool or magic wizard or anything like that. We are a consulting company um, and we work with our clients to help them solve complex content problems and move them towards a future around omni-channel publishing, personalization and the integration of new technologies like chatbots and voice UI. Um, we do this through a combination of consul consulting and training services. Um, so I noticed on this slide you talk about engineering content intelligence, and I hear the term content intelligence quite a bit out there. Um, maybe you can elaborate for us at the beginning here of what we're talking about when we're talking about intelligent content. So uh, we define really intelligent content as content that is both structurally and semantically rich. So it's uh, around putting together content that um, is, as I said, is, is sort of broken down, is structured, is, is, is broken into components, and those components have metadata and semantics applied to them. So the content knows what it is, where it is within the, fit, it fits within the, uh, the structure, and then has the metadata around it that allows it to be moved across systems. Um, and uh, I think really that's the key of what we do is really to reduce the friction from content processes and allow c companies to build content that can move across systems and across the organization. So. Great, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. And I know that as part of this, you proposed that, uh, as it says on this slide, uh, that, that we really need to all look at a new operating model for content. 
And one of the things I've heard you say in your presentations is customers don't care where your content comes from. Um, what do you mean by that? And, and how can we start addressing that in our own organization? Well, if you think about it as, you know, if you take your own view as a, as a consumer, when you, in, when you're interacting with a customer, um, you know, let's, I don't know, let's take Starbucks, for example, you know, if, if I'm, you know, want to go to my local Starbucks and I interact with their content through maybe looking at their website to see, you know, what, a drink is what the components of a particular drink are like one of the new holiday drinks you know what's in that i'll go to the website and take a look and then i decide maybe that um i want to order that on my way so i'll go on the mobile app and i'll order it um on the mobile app and then you know maybe when i get in the store i'll start looking at some of the in-store signage about some of the other things that they've got on offer and maybe pick up another product while i'm there while i'm doing that as far as i'm concerned i'm interacting with starbucks i'm not interacting with the starbucks web web team or I don't think I'm interacting with the Starbucks mobile app team, and and then when in the when I'm in the store thinking about that as being a, a you know a different team, it's all a Starbucks experience, um, and that's what I mean by about you know customers don't wear your aren't concerned about where your content's coming from. They just want consistent experience driven by content, be it a website, a mobile app, digital signage, whatever. Um, you know, um, if you think about it in a, in a more sort of, you know, um, tech environment, I'm not really worried when I go to the website, whether that the information is coming from the product marketing team, the, the, the tech, you know, I don't go looking for things because it's produced by the technical publications department or it's produced by the product marketing group or it's produced by the training group. I just want answers to the questions that I have about your product or your service. Um, so we really have to think about a content operating model across the enterprise that pulls content from across the enterprise um, and delivers it in a consistent, coherent um, way to drive a really good customer experience. So, you know, what what today we've been talking to a lot of our clients around is about putting together what we call a content services organization, which really is a, a cross-functional organ um, way of looking at content within the organization. And, and that really does help build the foundation for delivering a content transformation and thinking about content in a new way where it's actually driving a customer experience irrespective of what point that that customer is engaging with with you yeah that's that's interesting because i know uh, early on in tech uh, it seemed that a lot of times technology would drive what uh, the experience was so when a new web browser had a new feature in the 90s or early 2000s we'd all pile on to uh, sort of figure out how to, to use the tech as opposed to on right and unfortunately i think we're still we still see that with a lot of companies where it's their system that drives the customer experience instead of it being what the customer needs driving the systems to deliver that we're starting to see a shift where more people are, are sort of starting starting to take that outside in approach uh, you know what is it that understanding customer journeys what is it the customer's trying to do you know what's the transaction they're trying to do what's the process they're trying to do what's you know what sort of questions are they asking and how can we deliver that uh, and developing the systems to do that but yes there's, we're still in a lot of cases where we do have these silo systems that inform individual parts of the customer experience and that can often be a very disjointed frustrating experience um, but customer experience is really the only or is the, ma the major differentiator these days uh, and the companies that are going to survive are the ones that take that customer first viewpoint and they need the, the the internal processes and the functional teams inside the organization to be thinking that way too and thinking in terms of that cross operational model sure so as you take these uh, these three disparate teams uh, that you've highlighted on, the, on this slide, uh, the content strategy, content operations, and content engineering, which are some of the big uh, categories, I guess, of content operations, um, maybe you can uh, tell us how to how how you you work to bring these things together and and kind of create that unified experience. Yeah, so as I said, we have this uh, at a, this concept of a, a content services organization. Um, now, with some clients, that's actually a separate organization that they they specifically set up. In other areas, it could just be a matrixed committee type team. 
Um, but to, however you you are, you sort of build it, whether it's a you know a, a formal addition to the the org chart or whether it's just uh, you know something that becomes sort of part of the operational of, of the company. Um, the way we like to sort of position it is really that the company needs to build that organizational muscle around a content service, thinking in terms of a cross-functional content services team. Um, and and the, the three sort of pillars of that, if you like, it's like the, uh, you know, the uh, the stool analogy, you know, you can you can have a stool with three legs, but if you don't have all three legs working together, it's going to fall over. So really, you know, the three legs of content services is um, having a, you know, a content strategy um, and then and engineering the content to meet that strategy and then putting the, if you like, the technology and the systems and the operational side um, together to deliver that cross-functional um, holistic view of content. So it's developing that holistic view of content, engineering the content to be able to do it, and then putting the systems in place to deliver it. And that, those are really the three legs that form the idea around building that cross-functional team. Um, and this is where your sort of content heroes are going to come to play is within this environment of having um, making sure that these three areas work together. Okay, so you mentioned the content heroes, and I know you uh, you have some here in this deck uh, to talk about some of the key ones uh, that play a major role. Maybe you can walk us through those. Yeah, sure. So you know, as I said, I think really up front is the idea of the content strategist is really understanding for me the content strategist role is really understanding that customer journey understanding what the customer wants to do um, thinking about it if you like from a sort of uh, front end facing point of view and being fo focused on the message of, of what the company um, is positioning itself to do well, you know what is it that the company is selling what is it that they're trying how are they trying to help their customers be successful uh, and the message they're delivering on and if we want to sort of slip step, step to the next slide um, that sort of breaks that down really that the content strategist is really focused on sort of you know the uh, the, the classic uh, w's of uh, you know uh, when we're, we're learning about communications, it's the one thing we're all you know, taught, you've got to answer those, those questions around who are we or um, what is it that we do, where are we doing it, when are we doing it, and then also, you know, who, and it sort of also applies to our customers, understanding who our customers are, what it is that they want to do, when in their, in their journey, in their daily life, in their, in their job, do they want to interact with us, uh, and where do they want to do it, what sort of, um, channels are they interacting with us um, so you know really the content strategist is is sort of planning for the, the um, creation publication and governance of, of, of content that's usable and valuable to the customer and um, so you know I, I, to me that's what the content strategist is around is around looking at the message and what is it we want to go do um, so you really like this person Oh yep. yeah, it sounds like this person really lives uh, kind of uh, in in between a lot of traditional departments like marketing and and editorial yeah. teams and those things. Uh, uh, yes, I mean we tend to find that uh, you know a lot of companies say they have content strategists, but they may have a content strategist just focused on marketing, or a content strategist focused on technical documentation, or a content strategist focused on policies and procedures. There needs even if a, and it's great that companies have that, but there really needs to be a content strategist who maybe brings all that together, or in a smaller organisation, a content strategist who has that more holistic view and actually provides sits across or between provides the bridge between those functional silos in terms of thinking about how content can be used um, to deliver to deliver a, a, an ideal customer experience. Yeah, and and then putting those strategies in place. Um, across the organization. Sure. And, and then the content engineer's job is to take, if you like, work towards that strategy on being focused on what do the content models look like? What does, you asked about content, intelligent content earlier, uh, you know, and I said that's really content that ha has a, you know, defined structure and applied semantics to it. So that's, the con that's the other hero really working together is the content engineer is really focused on figuring that model out, figuring the, st the structure and the semantics um, that are needed. Um, so if we sort of flip to the next slide, it's really thinking about 
um, how we are actually going to go deliver that content. What, how do we need to engineer the content? You know, does it need to be in something like XML? Uh, if you know, if it's going to be structured in something like XML or you know HTML5 or whatever, you know, what's the schemas that we're going to go deliver that to? What's, what's the shape of that? What sort of taxonomies and um, do we need to? Uh, metadata do we need to apply to that content to be able to move it across the systems so really um, for me the content engineer is is um, the person who sort of helps take that strategy define how we're going to do it and provides the bridge between the strategy and the systems and the technology by understanding how we need to configure um, and actually mark up and build the taxonomy and semantics around the content to make it move across the organization now, one thing I've noticed about the content engineering role is a lot of times there's a lot of focus on this when you're implementing, uh, say, a content management system or mm -hmm. you have something new going on. Um, but it sounds like you're talking about uh, something that's more persistent. Uh, yeah, sort of, right? yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, a, a lot of organizations sort of believe that content modeling is a one and done exercise. It isn't. Um, you know, things are always changing. Um, the, the customers are changing as you know society is changing the way that you have to um interact with your customers uh, new legislation comes up you know things like gdpr i mean that massive impact on content modeling um you know think so it, it it is a persistent role it has to be one that yeah there may be a lot of work right up front about actually defining the content model but then a content model needs to become a living breathing asset within the organization and there needs to be somebody who's managing that understanding the impact of changes in strategy you know what happens when a uh, a new delivery channel comes on board you know we're, you know we're now moving towards chatbots and voice uh, voice interfaces and augmented reality how we you know are we modeling our content in a way that it can then be used in these new channels how, what sort of impacts are, are those? You know, somebody implements a new CMS. How are we going to map the content model to the new CMS or the new DAM or whatever? So yeah, it it is a persistent role. Just just thinking of content modeling and content strategy as a one and done exercise will not allow you to grow. Um, it may solve an immediate business need, but it won't position you for where you need to be next year, three years, five years down the line. So it needs to be a persist persist persistent um, role. Sure. Um, so it, it, if we look at the message and the model together, um, I guess my first uh, thought is uh, which comes first, the message or the model? Or uh, uh, how, how do these evolve together, I guess? Well, really, you have to start with the strategy. You know, a strategy, any strategy, whether it's a business strategy or a content strategy, you know, has to look at where you are now, where do you want to be, and then how do you get there, and and what's what's the message and the path that we want to take there. So you really need the strategy, and then you build the models to support that strategy. But it needs to be a um, done in, in um, synchron synchronously synchronously. Um, working together um, they have to do it working together um, you know you sure. start with the strategy but fairly early on in the strategy process you have to start thinking about okay how are we going to do this is what we're talking about actually feasible that's when you need the content to bring in the you know the content engineer and the sort of the two work, work hand in hand to enable things like content reuse uh, omni-channel publishing and things like that so it, it really you know maybe the strategy has a slight lead but you can't do the strategy and then throw it over the fence to the engine, the engineer to to be modeled. It has, they have to be done sort of together um, and work together. Uh, and by doing that, that really enables us to sort of unlock the power of our content assets. Great, yeah, that that uh, I think speaks again to that uh, persistent idea of these rules that they, they are ongoing and and uh, complementary. Uh, yes, and, 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 situations. The, and these these rules, these these roles, and the content. We don't have a slide on it, but and the content operations. You know, if you're thinking about the content operations, um, you know, per, um, part of the leg of of the, the the triangle we had earlier. You know, the content operations is you know owning the systems, mm -hmm. and making the systems work, and applying the model to the systems to to actually deliver it. Um, and those three really need do need to keep working together, as you said, in sort of that persistent 
way. Otherwise, you you know, you you're just basically ending up with another silo to, that solves one business problem but doesn't necessarily position the company for growth. So it really does need to to be a persistent part of it. And they should then own one. You know, once they've got the strategy and the model and the systems, they should own the governance around the growth of that as well and the use of that. So. Uh, it really does become, uh, and it's the way we position it with a lot of our clients, it really does become, as I said earlier, it becomes that centralized global cross-functional team. You know, localization is another sort of area that maybe, you know, could fall under a, a, a content services organization. But that's a whole other topic. But, uh, but you know, thinking thinking around those, those things that anything that impacts content, that impacts the authoring, management, and delivery of content is something that the content services organization even should not necessarily own, but should have at least uh, an involvement and a governance role in, or be, or be involved in. Yeah. Great. So uh, as we expand this out to, uh, you know, the, the larger organization, you, you have a quote here that I really like, customer experience and intelligent content takes teamwork. Maybe you can elaborate on what kind of teamwork uh, we should expect to, to have to, uh, to get to provide within our organization, or who we bring together into this team. Well, that sort of sort of goes back to that uh, you know earlier earlier quote of mine about you know the customer doesn't where you care where your content comes from. Delivering those sort of experiences that meets that expectation that we all have these days that we have a seamless experience with a with a uh, with a company. It's building that realization that actually everybody in the company is. Um, you know, it is involved in customer experience. It, they may not think they are, but pretty much everything that we do, if it goes to somebody outside the organization, is is a is a customer experience, is a brand experience. Every interaction that somebody has with content um, at any point in their customer journey is a brand experience. So really, it is part of the team. Um, I think Zappos have a you know a great philosophy that uh, they actually don't have a, anybody in the organization, one person in the organization who's responsible for customer experience, everybody in the company is responsible for customer experience. It's all part of the teamwork. So every interaction that we have with a customer is customer experience and it does take teamwork and to deliver from a content point of view to deliver that means that we need to be thinking in terms of intelligent content. You know, what content do we have? How do we put it together? Where can we deliver it? How's it modeled? And that's not, you know, Yes, we have the content services organization, but we have to sort of think in terms of collaborating outside of that with folks like, you know, the data scientists, the information architects um, and so forth, who are, you know, working with the IT systems. Um, if you start looking at things like augmented reality, you know, you're pulling content from a, many disparate sources to make that work, but you're also pulling information from you know, data-driven systems like customer relations management tools, you know, accounting, um, parts databases, engineering drawings, um, architectural plans, facilities plan, you know, depending on what the AR application is, um, you know, materials management, computer-aided design, they're all coming together to deliver that customer experience. And that means that we have to get involved with those, you know, and collaborate and work with the developers, the information architects, the data scientists, and so forth to, to, to build those new experiences that we're all moving towards. And that takes teamwork. We have to we have to think beyond the fact that we're just content folks. We're not we're customer experience. We're driving the customer experience, and we should be reaching out across the enterprise and embracing those people who are going to provide the raw data and the architecture and so forth for the content that we need to deliver in the future. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really uh, critical and and something I've certainly seen. Uh, done to various levels of success uh, over my career. Um, so looking now at the content intelligence operating model that you've been talking about, this is kind of getting closer to uh, my heart with BCL. We do a lot of work in, in this space. Um, but uh, maybe you can go over uh, some of this uh, chart here and, and what, what we're talking about as far as the operating model. Yeah, so really we see the operating model in two parts. One is the, the you know, well, we talked about the content services organization, but at the heart of that is is those three roles that we've talked about in terms of, uh, you know, a, a content strategy, content strategist, a content engineer, content operations, or uh, people in those roles pulling together to really um, define the, you know, 
what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and, and then the systems to go do it. Um, so that's sort of really at the tactical level. But we re we believe that uh, that that group can't really um, work in isolation. You know, in, in line with the sort of conversation we just had about sort of reaching out and teamwork and collaboration. Um, that so the content for a really good content services organization, as well as having the, the folks who sort of orchestrate those practices, you really need to be lean, um, reaching out and working with, with broader groups. So, you know, um, that could be working with the product owners, brand owners, brand managers, whatever, um, information designers, um, but also um, a lot of organizations, you know, have a customer experience council or a customer customer experience group um, that really, uh, you know, the, the content folks should be working closely with, in, um, even if they don't sort of report into that, they, they you know, they should be working with it. Um, and actually, as I mentioned, you know, the content exists all across the organization. And we've seen a, a large number of, of companies who are um, either have um, formal content communities of practice or even informal ones where people with an interest in content across the organization um, get together um, you know on a monthly basis for you know um, to talk about what, what's happening with content so to make sure that what we're doing in terms of content orchestration is reflected and understood across the across the organization so people don't start going off on different branches and different roads and different dead ends so while those those three if you like those three primary heroes of content, forming the, the content orchestration, the strategist, the engineer, and the operations person can really help up um, an organization for the actual full operating model to work efficiently. They need to be looking at and working with and collaborating with content communities of practice, customer experience people, and then product and brand owners and so forth to make sure that uh, we're delivering a really true truly cross-functional uh, content practice that can deliver a, a really great customer experience. Yeah, so it sounds like really content becomes sort of a proactive activity, uh, whereas in a lot of um, traditional <laughs> approaches, content was really reactive in the sense right, of... Right, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I will be honest, I, I, it makes me cringe whenever I hear somebody say, oh, well, you know, we're just in, we're in technical documentation and we're just an overhead or a necessary evil, that's not the case. Content is the lifeblood. <laughs> content is the lifeblood of every organization. Um, you can't do anything else. Um, you know, I've often said this, you know, every company, no matter what size it does, does five basic things. It creates a product or a service. Um, it, you know, you, if, you, if you're gonna sell it, you have to tell people about it. You wanna sell it, you wanna collect money for it, and then you wanna support it. You can't do any of those five things without creating content. You create content all, you know, from day one of a, a, a company coming in, being founded, you're creating content. Content is the lifeblood. It's, it's the place where everything that a company knows, does, and operates is in content. Um, it is yes. the best unlocked asset in any company. And the folks who produce content need to realize how important they are. Um, and we're not an overhead, we're not a necessary evil, we are the lifeblood of the company. That's where all the intellectual property of a company resides and comes together is in the content. Um, so, you know, I think it's up to us as content professionals to make other people realize that. And as you said, it be proactive about content, not just sit back and say, wait for somebody to say, I need you to create a document about X. It's like, how, how can we help drive customer experience, drive revenue? Uh, and increase our company's value and make our customers happier through content and what we know about content and our expertise and deliver it. And you can do that by building these sort of con you know content orchestration and practices groups and then building, reaching out to other cross-functional groups that deal with content and make them realize the importance of the content. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, it's not easy. Um, and I know a lot of folks are very unwary, are wary about networking and reaching out and putting their hand up. But um, if we as content professionals are going to be taken seriously, that's what we need to do. I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah, that's, <laughs> music to my ears there. Uh, and and really, it is a matter of I think uh, projecting that importance throughout the organization. Now, when I know a lot of our uh, listeners are. Uh, uh, from smaller organizations where they may not, they may look at something like this and say, well, we don't really have a, uh, you know, a set of product owners to involve, uh, you know, for a fairly small operation. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how this translates into a, a smaller organization. 
Um, yeah, that's actually a good point. I mean, we've done this with very large multinational companies, but I will tell you the the, the, the client I'm currently working in and, and uh, putting this in place with is an 80 person company. Um, and, uh, you know, what they've done is basically identified that uh, actually internally they already had a, somebody who could fill, you know, who was doing the content engineering role. They just weren't calling it that. They already had, you know, uh, somebody who had the skills for the content operations role. They, they've sort of gone outside and realized they didn't have a content strategist, so they're, you know, they're, they're recruiting for that role. Um, but they could have easily just have had, you know, people in, internally who already had the skills and expertise. You know, this doesn't need to be a large organization. It can be three people. Um, and, you know, it could be three people who report to different parts of the organization, but just get together on a, you know, weekly basis to talk about what we're doing with content. I mean, it can be as simple as that. Um, so, you know, practically it doesn't have to be like, you know, another group on the org shop. Like I said, we, we do have clients who've done that and built up separate organizations. We got clients where it's, you know, three people already across the organization who, you know, meet on a weekly basis to talk content and, and then go out. Uh, um, I think what it takes is that you need to find the people who are prepared to get up and talk and go out and network. Um, even in a small organization, you know, you, um, I, I've sort of talked about this before, you know, if, if, if you, you know, talk to people in other parts of the organization in finance, in marketing in whatever, you know, we, we all deal with people outside of our own department. Every time you do that, have a conversation with them about, you know, what sort of content are you guys producing? Is it something that we could be producing for a, you know, um, for a client is what we're producing, you know, is what the training department's doing have they got useful information that could be done used on the website could the technical documentation be on the website if we don't already do that um you know um start talking about that, that sort of thing um uh you know what, it sounds what like the, a kind of a i was just going to say it sounds like uh, you're proposing that you know this can be top down or kind of a grassroots yeah, approach. it can be a it can be a grassroots. You know, the best the best grassroots approach is always be marketing yourself and what you do internally. Uh, and as a content team, always be marketing what the content team does and the impact it has on the customers, and be marketing it, it internally. Um, that's probably the best approach to start building those bridges across functional silos, and then start building the bridges across the technology silos. But at the end so of the I day, comes... if I'm... sorry, I was going to say at the I, end I of the day. Say... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say at the end of the day, it all comes down to delivering what's best for the customers. And content people are really the best customer advocates. Yes, that's that's a really good point. Um, so so let's look at uh, this last uh, content slide here, uh, which talks about the content services organization as an orchestration layer. And I, I really like that terminology. Of course, the product I work for is called Harmonizer. So I've got <laughs> well, there you go. in, my, in my DNA, but uh, maybe you can elaborate on what you mean by an orchestration layer and, and how this kind of comes together. Well, actually, just to take the metaphor a bit further, you know, if you think about um, content maybe as being the sheet mu music for an orchestra, um, you know, um, just content, the sheet music on its own doesn't do anything. Um, if you think about uh, your content management system as, I don't know, say the violins, the instrument to deliver that, just the instrument on its own doesn't do anything. And then you think about the content creator as maybe, maybe being the, the musician. Um, to deliver a good sound, a good, you know, a good musical experience, you need the, you know, the, the musician, the instrument, and the sheet music to play together, but they can maybe just produce a solo. If you want a really good orchestral arrangement, you need multiples of those. You need multiple groupings of musician and instrument and sheet music, all pulled together and guided by a conductor to get your or to really get that orchestral experience. Um, and I see that content services organization is the conductor. They're pulling together the authors, the management systems, the strategy, and everything to deliver that overall orchestrated experience. So really that's what the content services organization is, if you want to take look at it from that with that metaphor in mind. They're the conductor of the orchestra, which is made up of the content and the systems 
and the creators to pull that together and deliver that nice harmonic experience. So I think that next slide summarizes that uh, very well. Uh, if we look at, um, can we, yeah. there we go. Yeah, uh, and that really comes down to, as I said, you know, delivering that, that harmonic experience. And as I talked about earlier, understanding and it being a, a, a persistent role that really drives the applications are and the, the governance around the, the workflow and the standards that we're going to use across the different content groups across the organization. So. Great. So uh, any other final words or tips on uh, uh, what we might do here and then we'll, we'll open the um, question. I, I guess my final word, you know, the, the idea here was we were talking about the heroes of content strategy or the heroes of content up earlier. Um, you know, to re this doesn't, you know, this approach doesn't have to be a top down mega approach. Like I said, it can be three people getting together once a week. Uh, you know, somebody who understands strategy, somebody who understands engineering, somebody who understands operations and what are we doing about content and then looking at outside across the other functions, what can they do with content? It can be a grassroots tactical approach that can bring big dividends and, you know, just don't be afraid to step up and show the importance of what we're doing um, across the, fun you know, cross-functionally and the importance of content as an asset in the organization. Um, it just needs a hero to step up and put their hand up and say, hey, look at what we're doing. And if we, if we, if we collaborate across the teams, we can deliver much better customer experiences. Great, and and I think to that point of you you saying that uh, someone you know you shouldn't be afraid to step up. I think uh, it can be intimidating when you're in an organization and and maybe it's traditionally work in a siloed sort of uh, approach uh, to do that. But I think uh, you know if if you're out there listening to webinars like this or attending conferences, reading. Uh, content strategy blogs and things, you might be a content strategist and not even know it yet, right? Yeah, exactly. We find a lot of people who are doing content strategy, content engineering and content operations, and they don't necessarily call themselves that or think of themselves that. And you're right. If you're the sort of person who's listening to this podcast, uh, listening, to, listening to this webinar, listens to podcasts, goes out and reads and is self-educating and stuff, you're probably the right person with the right mindset to step forward and start talking about how content um, and, and you know a content services approach can bring dividends um, and, and really leverage those assets that we're creating, managing, and delivering in a much better way. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, this has been really interesting. I thank you, Alan, for taking the time with us. Now, I know we uh, probably have a few questions out there, so I'll turn this back over to Marianne and, and she can. Uh, Take over from here. Yep. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen. Um, two comments uh, I have that I thought were just excellent. I love the um, statement Alan made that uh, content is the lifeblood of an organization, um, no matter if content is your primary source of revenue or the perceived expense of a business, you know, a business unit that's um, an expense. And I love the idea that everyone on this webinar is an accidental content strategist, like it or not. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, when you were, Chris, your comment about applying some of this to a smaller organization, um, alternately, um, we were wondering if you could comment, um, Alan and or Chris, about what to do when you are in an organization that's 10,000 plus, um, you know, in an environment where everyone thinks my content is the best and not willing to concede um, to one strategist. What are your thoughts about that? Um, the, uh, there's a couple of approaches you can take there. One is um, actually do some, re do some customer research and find out if your content is as good as you think it is. Um, whether you're making assumptions about your content. Um, find out if you're actually answering the questions that your customers want you to be answering in the way that they want answered. Um, and then build a business case to um, 
to go and you know uh, address some of those. And the thing is, I think you you in a large organisation, it, it's always going to come down to building a business case, um, and that means finding a project or something that has a an immediate or measurable return um, that you can put KPIs and even better put dollar amounts around it. So start start small. Um, find something that you can address that's got a known problem that you can address that you can address in in a relatively short period and has measurable results um, and then grow from there um, I, I will say pretty much every um, engagement we've done at a that's led to a content services organization approach has started with a particular problem or a particular project that a customer is trying to solve and then when we come in and talk to them and we were working on that we we take a look at that particular project within the broader scope of content across the organization so um, find a particular business problem find a way to solve it find a way to measure it but do it within while thinking about how what I'm doing here can be applied on a broader scale and once you can actually show actual results people will sit up and start to take notice so, you know, it's like uh, I always say about Mount, you know, you don't climb, climb, climb Mount Everest by running all the way to the top in one go. You do it by starting with the base camp and then taking one step forward, one step forward, one step forward. Find your base camp um, and go for that. All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> earlier in the webinar, you referenced metadata and metadata helps to move content around across systems. Um, the question came through is how often um, or should I routinely update my content metadata and likewise um, how often should I update my content structure? Uh, you should be looking at it at least once a year if not more frequently but you should at least be reviewing your taxonomies and your structure um, on an annual basis. Um, like I say, things change, particularly things around taxonomy. Um, uh, and if you're using taxonomy to drive search, the way that your clients are um, looking for your content could be changing. The words they use could be changing. There could be, um, you know, language moves very quickly. Language is always evolving. Um, so yes, you should be looking at taxonomy and metadata um, at least, uh, and ideally you structure once a year, I think. Yeah, I think uh, certainly making this a uh, ongoing and planned process uh, is something that I've seen uh, make a big difference in organizations when they, you know, they take the time every, like you said, annually or, or even more frequently to yeah, yeah. assess where they are. And um, so that answer leads to the next question of, um, how do I get started doing that once a year when I have a massive content set? Where where can I begin? Uh, like I said, find your base camp. Um, <laughs> you know, um, if you've got a massive content set, I would bet there's a large part of that content set that nobody's ever looking at. So first off, do a content audit and find out actually what content is actually being used and looked at. Get rid of the stuff that isn't is never looked at. Um, I'm going to cite Adobe here. They did that with their website, which had five million pages. They found 98% of those five million pages was never looked at. Um, <laughs> they're down to a million pages now, which is not two percent or five percent of five million. But they you know, drastically reduce their content set. Um, so that makes it easier to maintain by actually getting rid of the stuff that nobody ever looks at, um, which can be a painful exercise. I know. Um, and then the other thing is find out what content is your most used, most uh, uh, accessed, um, what gets the most response, what gets the most engagement, and start there with doing your uh, regular updates, uh, you know, your regular reviews. Keep, keep, the, keep the content that's you, the most useful, the most engaging, and the most value up to date. Um, So All right, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that uh, are, if there are any other questions, um, please do submit them now. Uh, but that you have answered all the questions um, that have that have come through. Um, 
So with that, I would like to thank you, Alan and Chris. Uh, I think this was really informative. And um, thank you everyone today for taking time to attend the webinar. Um, we hope to see you in future webinars. Uh, you can keep apprised of what's coming up in the DCL Learning Series by following Data Conversion Laboratory on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, connect with any of us here. Um, Chris and Alan are always happy to answer emails or talk more about this topic. Um, one last question did just come in. Um, do you have any favorite content management tools? <laughs> let's, um, let's on that. That's a big one. <laughs> I'm going to take my company now. A, a is a technology agnostic uh, company. We don't we uh, we don't recommend tools right off the bat because um, everybody's need is different. So that's my poli yeah, politi I'll, uh... politically correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, defer from that too. I am a product manager, so I have a bias uh, for the tool I create, but uh, it fits into a whole process. Um, of course, you're always welcome to reach out, and I can uh, share some of some some of our experience and what we offer. Um, but yeah, I won't. Uh, I won't give you a favorite tool besides the one I work on. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our participants. Um, we hope to see you again and um, enjoy the rest of your day. This concludes today's webinar. Bye.